uh, I find speaking before an international armored vehicles conference to be a bit uh, unusual, but uh, very enjoyable. It's enjoyable because of all the many friends we're here, as, as uh, General Adrian mentioned, uh, this war in Afghanistan uh, for the past 17 years uh, has been fought by a coalition, 50 nations, now still 39 nations still to this day. And I know many of you in the audience have served there, and most of your nations have served there. And so the cohesion and relationships that exist within the NATO alliance right now, I'd argue because of that, have never been better. And uh, this uh, moral component of warfare, human relationships, uh, cohesion, uh, joint and shared experience is absolutely essential to warfighting capability. And so that's why I'd say that NATO uh, enjoys this, uh, perhaps even better than any time in its history. So again, it's a pleasure to be with you, uh, many of whom have served there. I want to also take this opportunity to thank uh, the United Kingdom and the British Armed Forces for their service in Afghanistan and the great work that they have done there, as well as all of you who have served there and sacrificed so much. And I'll talk a little bit about Afghanistan and the policy today. I will touch a bit on, on uh, armored or uh, a vehicle capability at the end, because it is relevant to what we're doing in Afghanistan. But I'll primarily talk about Afghan policy and the direction of that uh, going forward. You know, we had a, over the weekend, you may have seen in the news, there was another terrorist attack in the city of Kabul on the Intercontinental Hotel. And of course, uh, these occur all too frequently uh, in a city of five million people, the fastest growing city in the world. You know, there's a, uh, one of the reasons these attacks occur in Kabul is it is such a dynamic, growing, thriving city, and that's a result of our presence there. So 15 years ago, that city consisted of 500,000 people. It's literally 10 times the size it was in those days, uh, it grown exponentially. And of course, that environment makes it easier for terrorists who are on a one-way trip to come into a city, kill themselves, and kill innocent people in the course of that, uh, and not have to worry about an exit plan. And that's indeed what happened. Uh, and sadly, you know, our thoughts and prayers go out to the 20 victims of that uh, terrorist attack. So this form understands what we're up against. You, uh, many of you are serving officers or have served in the past, you understand what's at stake here. But let me elaborate that a little bit. I want to talk, uh, while I'll talk about overall policy in Afghanistan, I want to also talk about the military components of, of that policy and why they are relevant for us today. So as a reminder, of course, 17 years ago, uh, why did we go to Afghanistan? The United States was attacked on 9-11 by terrorists who enjoyed the hospitality of the Taliban. Uh, we then went there uh, to uh, after offering them an opportunity to turn over those terrorists, they refused. We then went there to uh, move them out. Uh, and so the purpose of going there was to protect uh, our homeland, the United States. But we were joined, of course, by the entire uh, NATO alliance and a broader coalition of nations. And our NATO allies invoked Article 5, which is the provision in the North Atlantic Treaty for collective defense. And as such, uh, these allies and partners who joined the effort, many of you, uh, we're protecting your homelands as well as responding to a threat against an ally. And again, as an American, I want to say thanks to all of you who have done that and been with us for so long. Now, this terrorist threat still exists. It is, uh, we have prevented another 9-11 style attack on, on America, and there have been uh, terrorist attacks uh, across the world, of course, but I'd argue that it could have been much worse had we not been there. And why do I say this? So in the region, Afghanistan and Pakistan, this area, you've got 21 terrorist organizations. Now these are US designated terrorist organizations. To give you a sense of scale, there's 99 globally, 21 uh, exist in this region. So this um, is the highest concentration of terrorist groups anywhere in the world. So there may be places where certain terrorist groups are larger, like ISIS has more members in Syria than it does uh, than it does in Afghanistan, but, but the group is present. So the point is, this concentration of terrorist groups is, is the highest in the world, and we need to keep pressure on these groups to prevent them from realizing their ambitions. Now, many of them have local or regional ambitions, but some of them have global ambitions, and specifically Al-Qaeda and Islamic State uh, do desire to conduct attacks in your homelands as well as mine. 
So our collective efforts in, Af in Afghanistan not only protect our homelands from these groups, but there's another important issue, especially here in Europe, and that's the one of migrancy. And so Afghans have constituted the second largest group of migrants into Europe uh, a few years ago. And so I'd argue that stability in Afghanistan helps not only uh, protect us from the threat of terrorism, but reduce the potential for migrancy out of the region. And in this, in this respect, we've made enormous progress in Afghanistan. So the, the advances that have been a result of your nation's contributions uh, and mine have uh, advanced education, health care, human rights, infant mortality, maternal mortality, life expectancy has gotten better, communications, uh, the list goes on. The point here is these are all indicators uh, of, the, of, improve, of improvements to the lives of Afghans, which again can help with a degree of stability and protect us from these two threats of terrorism and migrancy. So this, uh, the, the other element I'd say is that the, uh, the credibility of NATO and the credibility of this coalition, certainly my country, is also at stake in Afghanistan. This is extremely important. And increasingly in the last year or two, and we heard uh, General Carter speak to this uh, at Rusi recently, about the threat posed by Russia. And we are seeing uh, increased uh, malign influence of Russia in there. So there are those, and I, and I only mention that because there are those who would like to see us fail in Afghanistan as a way to undermine the credibility of NATO, the United States, and the broader coalition. So for all these reasons, Afghanistan remains extremely important. And then I'll talk a little bit about the changes uh, we see coming up and why it's important. But I would argue that with the recent changes in policy we're seeing, a real opportunity for success coming over the next few years. But before I get into that, you know, this, this progress we've made so far, this protection of our homelands has not been without a lot of sacrifice. And there have been tens of thousands of Afghans killed and thousands of Americans and coalition forces who've sacrificed there. And, I, and again, uh, th this is a place that has been at war for over 40 years. And so this, uh, uh, we're, we're the most recent chapter in this. Uh, so, so there's been a tremendous amount of sacrifice. And again, I want to highlight the Afghan sacrifice. They want to fight for their country. They want to protect their country. They view it as a matter of honor that they are the ones who are protecting their country and sacrificing for their country. And they deeply appreciate all the sacrifices that our nations have made there. And I want to make that point on their behalf. So our obligation as soldiers, uh, in part, uh, is to deliver on that sacrifice. And if we were to leave or to fail in Afghanistan, we would strengthen the enemy's ideology and embolden the terrorists who already exist inside all of our countries. And so in addition uh, to the previous reasons I mentioned, protecting our nation from terrorism, reducing migrancy, uh, delivering on the sacrifice of so many in Afghanistan, Again, if we were to lose or, or leave, uh, then uh, this would embolden those that already exist inside our own countries. And we would be strengthening the ideology of these terrorists, not weakening it. So the key to success then in all of this is to convince the enemy that they cannot win. And the best option, and that their best option would be to engage in a reconciliation process. You know, to use uh, nonviolent political means to settle their differences as opposed to war. So the goal then of, of NATO and the United States policy in Afghanistan is to achieve a peaceful reconciliation of the belligerents, which lowers the level of violence to a level that can be managed by the Afghan security forces. So it's, uh, it would be uh, naive to think we're going to eliminate all violence in Afghanistan but to lower the level to a level that, that can be managed by their forces is our objective. And we do that through uh, driving the enemy uh, to engage in reconciliation. Now, as, as we all know, I'm speaking to a group of military professionals, war is a contest of wills. And so the, uh, the enemy must believe uh, that, that we have the will to be successful in the will to win. And for much of this war, the enemy has believed that the coalition did not have the will to win, and therefore they had no incentive to negotiate. And this, um, why do they believe this? Because even when we went into our surge in 2009, we announced the date that we would be leaving, and then we left on that date, and we stayed on that azimuth all the way up until December of 2016. 
So if you're the enemy and, and your opponent has announced when he's leaving and then leaves on schedule, then you believe that they have lost their will and that you can therefore, you simply need to outlast us and you will win. Okay, so in, uh, in, the, in the summer of 2016, NATO at the Warsaw Summit announced four more years of support for the Afghan security forces, four more years of financial support. And the 39 nation coalition all recommitted to staying until the job was done. And indeed, the military advice from the military leadership of the alliance was that our policy in Afghanistan should be conditions based and not time based. So this recommendation was adopted by the alliance. Later in 2016, at the Brussels donor conference, uh, close to 50 nations pledged uh, $15 billion in development assistance to the government of Afghanistan. And of course, just last August in 2017, President Trump announced a U.S. South Asia policy, which committed to a conditions-based, not a time-based approach in Afghanistan. So in this contest of wills, if you're the enemy, the calculus has now changed. Your opponent, the alliance, the United States, have now announced that they're staying on a conditions-based basis, not on a timeline. And therefore, the number one thing I'd say is uh, th this is key to driving the enemy to reconciliation. So this uh, commitment to a successful outcome, the willingness to remain on a conditions-based, not a time-based approach, are the, are the most important factors in changing the calculus to achieve a successful outcome through reconciliation. Now, how do we do this, though? Uh, other than this statement of, of intent, how do we actually drive the enemy to reconciliation? Well, we do it through pressure, and it's different forms of pressure, social pressure, diplomatic pressure, and military pressure. So first, on, on the social pressure. So social pressure is applied in a number of ways. Uh, the first way, I'd say, is at the ballot box. So in 2018 and 2019, the Afghan people will select their leaders at the local level, the parliamentary level, and the presidential level. This. Uh, Practice of democracy, this election of leaders, if done credibly, this is extremely important, these need to be credible, transparent, and, and legitimate elections, will increase the legitimacy of the Afghan government in the eyes of the people. And remember that in Afghanistan, 87% of the population reject the Taliban. This is not a popular insurgency. This is one that is uh, uh, supported through, through a number of ways, but this is not a popular insurgency. So legitimizing the government and then delegitimizing the enemy in a number of ways because of their criminal activity, because their involvement in the narcotics trade, which is growing. These are the ways that the social legitimacy of the government has increased and the social legitimacy of the enemy has decreased. An additional way that social legitimacy is uh, decreased is, is through the uh, religious ulemas, the community of Islamic scholars in Afghanistan and throughout the Muslim world. And what we're seeing increasingly is some of these ulemas are beginning to speak out against the tactics and techniques being used by terrorists in the name of their religion. And things like suicide bombing, wage, waging false jihad, and so forth. We are now beginning to see religious scholars uh, take positions against this. Now, this will take time to build, but it is encouraging to see more ulemas beginning to speak in these terms. So in the social dimension, it's the Afghan people uh, voting for their leadership. It's a delegitimizing of the enemy because of their tactics and the hardship they brought to the Afghan people. And there's a religious component to this as well, all of which are in the works. Next, let's talk about diplomatic pressure. So as part of the US-South Asia policy, uh, we talk about uh, putting pressure on external enablement of the insurgency. As military professionals, we all know that uh, any insurgency that enjoys external enablement is very difficult to defeat. And so this insurgency has enjoyed that. And my government in particular and many other governments are engaging at the diplomatic level to reduce that external enablement. This is extremely important. Now, I'm not going to add anything to that conversation today. Those, uh, uh, many of you have seen those uh, positions staked out by our governments, uh, either in public and, and much of this work is going on in private. But this is extremely important. And the point is to build a consensus against these terrorist organizations 
that uh, they bring nothing but uh, hardship to the entire world, not just to Afghanistan. And it's important that as a body of civilized nations that we stand against them. So this, this effort is extremely important, uh, a critical component of the effort, the pressure to, to reduce external enablement so that the enemy is forced to, to live and fight in Afghanistan where they won't survive. Okay, so shifting then finally to military pressure. So, uh, and this is where I want to spend most of my remarks. So again, we've talked, uh, but, but before I do that, I want to say all of these forms are, of pressure are necessary to be successful. So no single uh, form of action is going to be successful. Military pressure is necessary, but not sufficient to win. And so military pressure has to be applied well, has to be uh, applied effectively, but in and of itself, it is not enough to win the war. We have got to do these other efforts, build an international coalition or an international consensus for reconciliation, support an Afghan-led reconciliation process, bring social pressure to bear on the enemy, bring diplomatic pressure to bear on, on uh, external enablers, and apply military pressure on the battlefield. So taken together, this is what brings us to a successful outcome. So, but let, but let me focus on the military pressure being applied in Afghanistan right now. And so the goal of military pressure uh, is, is to expand the control of the Afghan government and security forces from the present uh, two-thirds of the population to about 80% or more. Now, there's nothing magical about this figure of 80%, but if, if, again, as students of history, you know that when a government reaches that amount of control over the population in an insurgency, they begin to achieve a critical mass and a tipping point where the enemy is driven to irrelevance. They may still be present, but they're driven to irrelevance and the level of violence gets down to a level that's manageable. So that's why the target of 80%. So the idea is to expand control to 80%. How do the, how do the Afghans do this? They do it through offensive action, offensive action. And you know the, and so I'm going to spend some time talking about how the Afghan security forces will go on the offensive now and into the future, and then this will eventually get around to armor vehicles. So the, uh, when, when we talk about uh, the NATO Warsaw Summit in 2016, after that summit, when uh, President Ghani returned successfully and the international community indicated that it was going to support Afghanistan for another four years, we all sat down with his security team and discussed how do we leverage these four years to be successful. And we looked at what had worked in the past, what, it didn't, what didn't work so well. And as many of you know who've, who've uh, either served in Afghanistan or been there, our theory in the past has been that the army was the clear force in, in a counterinsurgency, and the police were the hold force, meaning the ones that would cement the control over the population. And our conclusion was is that this has not worked. This has not worked. So on, on the one hand, the, uh, um, the police then were drawn away from their civil policing mission and into a paramilitary role with the result that criminality, kidnapping, murder, et cetera, went on. So the, so the connection between the people and the government and the protection that would normally be provided by the police in many respects has been absent because they've been drawn into a paramilitary role. And so we want to free up the police to do civil policing. Uh, so in order to do this then, uh, and the, we looked at who should be the clear force and who should be the hold force. And so the, the, the amendment, the, the refinement we made to the operational construct going forward is that the special forces who have proven highly successful against the enemy would be the clear force and the army will be the hold force and then the police can focus on civil policing. So this is a fundamental shift in the operational construct in Afghanistan that frankly has not made, made any news outside of Afghanistan, but extremely important in, uh, in allowing us or getting us to the point where we're going to be successful in these offensive operations. So in order to have an adequate size to, to the clearing force, though, we need to increase the size of the special forces. And so what we noticed in the last few years is that the Afghan commandos, the Afghan special police, have never been defeated in battle against the Taliban. And so in, in all of the uh, fights around the country, whenever these soldiers or police showed up at the scene, they won. And it really was just a question of how long it took and how many uh, casualties. But typically, their casualties were lower, and their success rate, again, has been almost 100%. 
So we said, we simply don't have enough of them. So we made a decision in 2016 to double the size of the Afghan Special Forces. We also noticed with the Afghan Air Force that where we had trained pilots and effective airframes, we had good success and great confidence that this instilled. So we made a decision to triple the Air Force. And so doubling the size of the Special Forces and tripling the size of the Air Force is what enables us to say that the Afghan Special Forces become the offensive force of the Afghan Army, and they are the ones who are going to retake uh, this uh, 80% or take 80% population control of the country. So the let me uh, so so that's the operational construct and how that changed in 2016. I'll now get into some of the details of actually implementing that. But but first off, I want to talk about the the human dimension of of offensive action. And so um, in 2017, okay, we, uh, so we began building the uh, Afghan um, special forces, doubling them in size in 2016, recruiting new soldiers, starting new commando classes. These are not forces that you can produce overnight. Indeed, you need to take time to ensure you get the right soldiers, you vet them properly, you train them properly, and then you train the units properly. So even though we made this decision in 16, the recruitment, the training went on all through 2017, and now these units are beginning to arrive on the battlefield for 2018. Likewise with the Air Force, you make a decision uh, to adopt new airframes. You need to buy them. You need to train pilots. Again, this will take some time, but that has started as well. And so in the case of the Air Force, we've got uh, UH-60 aircraft being fielded. Pilots have been through training. They're fully qualified on the UH-60, A-29s, MD-530s. Likewise with the commandos. Again, recruitment and training ongoing. But let me let me jump to the human dimension real quick. So with this, with all of this in train now, at the end of 2016, after the Warsaw Summit and be, and going on through 2017, President Ghani turned to the human dimension of offensive operations. The human dimension of improving the capability of his armed forces. And we started with leadership. And so in May of 2017, President Ghani, based on uh, some uh, significant high profile attacks really dro drove the issue home. Uh, President Ghani re uh, replaced five of six Corps commanders, the Chief of General Staff of the Army and the Minister of Defense. Okay, so it's a pretty sweeping change uh, of, the, of the Afghan leadership. When he did that, he lowered the average age of, of, of that cohort by 10 years. Okay, so this gives you a sense uh, in part of, of why we were having challenges on the battlefield. This new group of Corps commanders then fought in 2017. And for the first time uh, since the Afghans have owned the war after the end of ISAF, we, we saw offensive operations occurring, uh, albeit at various levels, across the entire country Simultaneously, At one point, we had offensive operations ongoing in six corps at the same time. Very unusual. Never happened before. Uh, the effects on the enemy were, were telling. In 2015, we saw the enemy attempt to seize cities. In 2016, they attempted eight times to seize a city in Afghanistan. Why? They thought we had lost our will. They thought they could seize cities and provinces, put up the Taliban flag, and then negotiate from a position of strength. But in 2016, they failed in all of these attempts. So they, they lowered their level of ambition in 2017 to focus on districts. In 2017, as they attacked districts, again, they ran into this new offensive mindset on the part of the Corps commanders and, again, suffered extremely high casualties. So by the end of 2017, we saw, again, another lowering amb of ambition to go from offensive operations to seize and hold terrain to more guerrilla-style tactics. So in the face of this offensive mindset and improved capability, we're starting to see the enemy lower their level of ambition, trying to stay relevant by conducting terrorist attacks and showing that they're still there, but no longer trying to seize and hold terrain as they were in 2015 and 2016. Okay, so the big change that's going to occur in the human dimension, given the success that we saw with this replacement of uh, Corps commanders, and these, these new commanders were selected based on a merit-based system. Uh, and so this was done by a high oversight board created by President Ghani, which reviews all candidates, uh, looks at them and, in terms of merit, experience, education, and so forth, and then selected them, as opposed to the previous system, which was more personality-based. 
And so now the other thing that President Ghani has uh, done in the last year and working with the leadership of the military is to look at the, the personnel management system uh, of their military. And so to give you an example, uh, in, the, in the old system, the retirement age for a general in the Afghan army was 70. And the life expectancy in the country is 60. So think about that one. It's, it's, uh, so so the, the clearly it was out of balance with, with the, uh, not only with their own demographics, but also with international norms. So we laid out for President Ghani the different uh, personnel management systems, the different armies. You know, they assert, you know the US, some of the Western armies, US, UK, Germany, but also some of the regional armies, India, even Pakistan. And when you look at those armies, you'll see they have uh, an age requirement. You must be a certain rank by a certain age or you retire. You have a time in grade requirement, how long you can remain at a certain rank, and then an overall age requirement. Regardless of what rank you achieve, you must retire by this age. And so he adopted a model similar to the Indian Army. And the Indian Army retirement age is 62. So by simply adopting this new model, th this, this model was put into law called the Inherent Law uh, that um, President Ghani has uh, sent to Parliament. They're, they're going back and forth, but the, 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 the notifications have gone out. When you look at the impact of this law on the leadership, the human dimension of the Afghan security forces, what it means is within the next year, about 2,500 colonels and generals will retire from the Ministry of Defense and roughly an equal number from the Ministry of Interior. And so, so you can imagine the impact of that on the uh, Army and the police. On the positive side, uh, it'll, it'll enable a generational change in the leadership of the Army and the police. And this new generation of Afghans, if you haven't had the chance to meet them, are a very inspiring group. So they're young, they're energetic, they're devoted to their country, they want their country to be successful, and they will do it if given the chance. And so getting this generation of leadership into positions of, uh, of command and authority within the military and the police is going to be a significant and fundamental change uh, to the Afghan security architecture. So, so first and foremost, uh, this is the generation, this next generation of Afghans that will build upon the great work done by their predecessors. And I want to mention that many of these leaders who are retiring have done enormous service to their country. Uh, they retire with dignity, with respect of the entire country, with the gratitude of the, of the entire country. But many of them have voluntarily said they will retire in order to make, make room for the next generation. So this is extremely positive, and this will bring about a fundamental change in the human dimension uh, of leadership inside the Afghan security forces. So that so that's uh, point number one. Um, let me uh, let me go back though to the uh, offensive operations and the offensive capability. So currently, right now in the winter, so normally in the winter in the past in Afghanistan was considered a lull. You know, we had a thing we called the fighting season, which began in the spring and ended in the fall. But the Afghan army is staying on the offensive over the winter. So right now, there's offensive operations going on in 13 of Afghanistan's provinces, roughly a third of the country has offensive operations continuing over the winter. The, um, I mentioned the Air Force, and, the, uh, and, and let, me, let me get a little more specific about the uh, air capability. So the, the additional airframes uh, being added um, to the Afghan security forces really improve their close air support capability. So the close air support platforms primarily are the A-29 uh, Takano. It's a, it's a propeller-driven light bomber and the MD-530 helicopter, Little Bird, uh, which has proven extremely effective in, uh, in close support of infantry. Uh, the the UH-60 Blackhawks are beginning to arrive, uh, and then the first, they're, they're in two variants. One is a transport variant, uh, and the other is a has a short wings on it, mounted with weapon systems, and so it's a fixed forward firing variant. So with rockets, machine guns, uh, again, to be used in close, close air support form to the Afghan army. So in the last year alone, this Air Force, uh, even though it's not grown to its full capability, flew over 15,000 sorties in support of security forces. And these numbers will steadily increase. And so we'll add another uh, uh, multi-role aircraft, the 208, 
the AC-208, which will be in a transport configuration that is being used right now, but also in a bombing configuration. And so these, uh, this, this range of airframes adds to their existing fleet, which was mainly uh, Russian-built MI-17s and, and MI-35s gunships. But, but frankly, many of these are falling out of service because of age, because of maintenance challenges, uh, what have you. And we're retraining those pilots to fly these new airframes. And then training new pilots who are, who are, who are not being trained on any Russian-style airframe that purely get trained on the new airframes. So both forms of training are going on. We're also conducting uh, extensive training of, of Afghan forward air controllers, of uh, the maintenance personnel, and frankly, that's what will take the longest, and then the staffs, of the, the air staffs and the ground staffs on how they work air support in close uh, support of offensive maneuver on the ground. So all of this has been used extensively in 2017, and we're continuing to deepen uh, their understanding and practice of this as we go forward into 2018 and beyond. So the point here, again, just to be clear, this is the Afghan Air Force controlling close air support by, the, uh, by uh, their airframes in support of the Afghan Army with no advisors present. This is going on right now. and has been going on all year. Now, we do, we do provide advisors, and we'll provide more advisors in the coming year but I want to, want to be clear about this. Okay, so the Afghan army is conducting independent offensive operations in many cases. And then in other cases, of course, we're using our, uh, under my U.S. authorities, we use U.S. combat enablers in support of the Afghans under certain circumstances. Uh, and, and of course, we provide advising in many capacities in their training locations, in their schools, in their ministries, and elsewhere. So let me talk about the Afghan Special Forces. So I mentioned we're eventually tripling the size of the Air Force and doubling the size of the Afghan National Army uh, Special Operations Corps. So what are some of the benchmarks in that? This year in August, uh, President Ghani announced the formation of an Afghan National Army Special Operations Corps. So previously, this had been a two-star command. It's now grown to a three-star command it's grown from two brigades to five brigades. So this is the doubling of this uh, force. So, so first they added a thing called the National Mission Brigade. So the National Mission Brigade are the high-end counterterrorism forces of the Afghan National Army. These guys are very good. You can see one of these soldiers on the screen. Okay, they're trained uh, day, night, um, uh, just as you would see in, in any Western-style uh, counterterrorism force, and arguably the best in the region. And so they exist in the form of special police units. That's a soldier uh, pictured here is a special policeman. And, and the, in the form of uh, Katehas, which is a high-end army uh, special forces capability. They have special forces battalions, two of them, uh, with, with operational detachments modeled like American special forces units. So they have their high-end counterterrorism military force, special forces battalions, and then a, a single commando Kandak, six Kandak, that's dedicated to the close-in support of these CT forces. So that exists in the Special Mission Brigade, and they have their own Special Mission Wing, 777, which is uh, MI-17s, highly trained pilots, fully night qualified. So th this capability, again, is the, is the Afghan capability to go against these 21 terrorist organizations inside the country. So this is the result of the 15, 17 years of investment that the alliance has made, is the Afghans now have an incredible capability for counterterrorism. This is the force that, that went into that terrorist attack over the weekend, Triple Two, the special police unit in Kabul, and reduced that situation quickly. How sadly, the terrorists had killed a number of uh, innocent victims before they got there. But every terrorist attack in Kabul ends the same way. The terrorists are dead, and Triple Two is, uh, is clearing the objective. And they have proven very successful against all these terrorist attacks inside Kabul. Okay, so back to the Special Operations Corps. So that was stood up in August. We will expand from two Special Operations Brigades then uh, to, to, to four in addition to the National Mission Brigade. Inside these, uh, inside these um, units will be new commando Kandaks. And then there will also be, uh, so this expansion of the commandos 
Again, in the past, we've had 30 companies, and we're growing to over 60 companies. So this has been done a couple of ways. One, by bringing in new uh, recruits right out of the, right out of the uh, society. And what we're finding is um, we have uh, more recruits than we can handle in the commandos, and they're very fit and very dedicated. And so the demographics in Afghanistan being what they are, with 70% of the population below the age of 28, and unfortunately, a high level of unemployment. We have a lot of educated, uh, fit, very competent, uh, in some cases, multilingual youth that want to serve in the special forces of their country. And so we have no, uh, no, no um, shortage of volunteers who want to join. And so we've been able to recruit them, run them through training, uh, and we've graduated them, and we'll start fielding the first additional commando companies this year, but the full effect of the additional 30 commando companies will not arrive till next year. So that's, uh, that's the growth there. Now, this force that I just outlined, this is the primary offensive force of the Army. This is the force that retakes uh, the additional population in the country and gets to 80% population control. We'd, we also are doubling the size of the special police. So the special police I mentioned triple two, the special police unit for Kabul, so that almost every major city in Afghanistan, Kandahar, uh, Herat, Masari Sharif, Kunduz, Jalalabad, as well as Kabul, will have a special police unit. And these special police units, these counter-terrorist police, will be the ones that will help uh, defeat terrorists inside these urban areas as they grow. So this is extremely important. Now. This brings me to another part of the special force. As part of this increase of the, of the number of commando companies, we are adding what we call mobile strike candacs to the special forces. And so in the Afghan structure, we have had uh, two brigades of, of mounted uh, regular infantry, if you will, in mobile strike candacs uh, that have existed for a couple of years. These. Uh, what we are now doing is taking those units, the soldiers are going through commando training, indeed the first group has already. Many of them wash out and are replaced with new commando recruits. So every soldier in these mobile strike vehicle uh, brigades becomes a commando. And then once they are all commandos, they go through another 12 weeks of training, collective training on their vehicles on how to fight uh, commando style operations with the benefit of the mobility, the firepower, the protection that they are afforded by these vehicles. So we're producing seven of these Kandaks. There will be called, the Afghans uh, have chosen the name Cobra Strike Kandak. Uh, we field three this year and the remainder in the coming years. Let me talk a little bit about these mobile strike Kandaks. So, so the, the, uh, the core of them is built around their uh, mobile strike platoons, and of course you have three companies, uh, three platoons each, four vehicles in each platoon. So this is the nucleus around which the Kandaks are built. Uh, and then these uh, companies have 60 millimeter mortars, so you've got a, a mobile, capable, good close fighting skill uh, companies that can move around the battlefield rapidly. The battalions have a headquarters company, and this headquarters company comes with the enablers that you would expect to find, engineers, medical evacuation, reconnaissance, anti-tank, and medium mortars. And then they, each of these Kandaks has an intelligence company because we're fighting in a counterinsurgency environment, so they have human intelligence capability, counterintelligence capability, signals intelligence capability at the battalion level. And then finally, they have a support company, similar to what you, uh, mechanics, uh, et cetera, similar to what you would find in, in one of our formations. So. In the American context, it, it, it's almost like a striker battalion uh, that you would see uh, where we have you know, striker, striker vehicles in our Ranger Regiment uh, that give mobility, firepower, connectivity, intelligence, uh, full combined. The only thing they don't have is a mounted gun system. Uh, but again, they do have heavy and light mortars and they have the great close air support provided by the Special Mission Wing and by the Afghan Air Force. So these new formations then, when we talk offensive capability in the Afghan army, you've got 
uh, dismounted commandos, mounted commandos, the uh, special mission wing, the Afghan Air Force, uh, as well as uh, the high-end counterterrorism forces. So th this is the force that goes on the offensive in the Afghan uh, army and retakes the country and drives the enemy militarily to reconciliation. So the areas that they clear then are held by the Afghan army. So, so the Afghan army becomes, yes, it does local offensive operations, and we've seen some of those go quite well, but primarily they'll be focused on holding the, the uh, population and terrain that is gained by the special forces going forward. So the, uh, I did want to say a word about, about maintenance. Uh, and, and again, as a, a former paratrooper, maintenance has never been high on my, on my list of things that I focused on when I was a lieutenant in the 82nd. But uh, as we all know as professionals, it's absolutely critical uh, to the success of this organization. So the maintenance approach across the whole Afghan army and especially inside the special forces is extremely important. So it really, really comes down to an enterprise level plan across the army to help them with their logistics and maintenance. And this is all being done by our combined security uh, transition command. And this um, includes a national maintenance strategy, uh, which over the next five years um, focuses on vehicle maintenance, but ma uh, maintenance management, supply, warehousing, and quality control. Now let me, let me come back to the human dimension of this. So we experienced a tremendous amount of corruption and inefficiency inside the Afghan maintenance system up through 2016 as President Ghani and his team uh, and I sat down and talked about this. One of the first things uh, we looked to fix was the human dimension. So he issued an order to replace anyone who'd been in the maintenance system for over three years was replaced. And so th th this was, uh, again, radical surgery. But what we found is as we've removed these people who've been in the system for 10 years or so um, and replaced them with younger, uh, better educated, and then um, folks that we then trained. This has helped us to improve in terms of reducing corruption and improving the effectiveness inside the maintenance and logistics system. So that's been extremely important. So this is all part of our national maintenance strategy, which is unfolding over the next few years. So uh, to, uh, to, to finish up here, and I look forward to your questions, this, um, what I, what I describe for you today is, again, why Afghanistan is important, why it's important to all of us, to all of our nations, why the, why the cost of failure in Afghanistan will be unacceptable to any of us, and then articulated how our nations have come together uh, through NATO and the coalition and my own country to formulate a policy that can lead to success, that can lead to winning. Winning is defined as achieving a reconciliation with the belligerents that lowers the level of violence to a level that can be managed by the Afghan security forces. How do we do that? We do that through pressure. We do it through social pressure. We do it through diplomatic pressure. We do it through military pressure. I described to you how we apply military pressure. We apply it through offensive action. And key to offensive action are the Afghan special forces. And I described how they're composed and what they're doing going forward to enable them to go on the offensive. All of this is made possible by advisors from your countries. Okay, so the U.S. is modestly increasing the number of advisors. We've had a slight increase uh, in the number of advisors internationally, and we're at about the right size. So we're approaching that number. We still have some shortages to fill, but we're approaching that number of the right number of advisors to enable the Afghans to implement this policy going forward. And again, finally, I want to close with a question of will. We have demonstrated that we as a coalition have the will to succeed. And all of this, this combined pressure, uh, the, re the recalculation in terms of international will is what uh, will change the calculus of the enemy and drive them to reconciliation as this policy plays out. So this is how the war ends in Afghanistan, with the reconciliation of the Taliban that lowers the level of violence. And I believe it is within reach if we implement the policies that we've adopted. And we do it along the lines of what I suggested here. Again, the Afghans own this fight, and they want to own this fight. This is not a return to combat operations by the alliance. The Afghans own the combat operations in their country. It's a matter of honor for them, and they're doing it well, and they are paying the price to take back their country. 
And after all they've endured in this 40 years uh, of uh, warfare in their country, they want this. They want peace and they deserve a chance. And if we help them gain it, it's better for us by protecting our own countries from terrorism that emanates from the region and reducing the threat of migrancy. So uh, again, I want to say thanks to all of you from the nations who contributed to this coalition. Uh, it, it is a, a tremendous uh, privilege and honor to, to command your forces and to be the commander in Afghanistan. And again, um, I want to appreciate your, uh, your attention here today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, we're right up to the time, but however, it's too good an opportunity to miss to allow um, a couple of questions out there. I think if we if we do five minutes or so of right. questions, we're That's most good. grateful. Thank you, Mick. If you'd like to take the questions yourself, could I ask you to stand and uh, give your name mm -hmm. and say where you come from, what job you're doing, and then pose your question to General Nicholson. Thanks. Sir. Thanks for being here, Mike Duby from Revision Military. If uh, the political leadership of the coalition was to say, what else do you need, what would you tell them? Yeah, thanks, Mike. The, um, I've had that opportunity uh, to answer that question, and basically we're getting what we need. And so number one was the policy. And so I, you know, as uh, General Bradshaw mentioned, I've been in command uh, in February, it'll be two years, and much of that time has been spent um, in, the, in the policy process with the Alliance and with my own nation. And now we have a policy that I've outlined here that enables us to get to, get to a successful conclusion to win. And so the additional uh, capabilities that are coming into country that are flowing in now under the new policy, the additional authorities, the additional Alliance contributions, uh, the money stayed roughly the same. Uh, and, the, uh, and then the, the key diplomatic components and social components are the things that we really need. The international consensus and the support of peace is extremely important. You know, the things we need on the ground is, as a soldier, we, we, we have or are on the way. Again, with some additional, we still have some holes to fill in the NATO combined joint statement of requirements, but that is being worked actively by the leadership of the Alliance. And, we, and we're hopeful of getting those filled. Uh, but the, um, the, the, the diplomatic pressure and the help on the social front are areas, of course, where we in the military just play a supporting role, and that's where we really need help. We really need the, uh, the international consensus and support of reconciliation. We need the hard work to be done on building uh, that consensus and making a successful reconciliation possible. And then, of course, we, we are respectfully requesting of the uh, religious ulemas of, of the Muslim world to really focus on this issue of extremism, suicide bombing, uh, false jihad, uh, and I'm quoting, uh, Af you know, re religious scholars and calling this a false jihad. Uh, th this is where we really need help as well. Uh, thanks for the question. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, hi, General. It's actually along similar lines. I'm Robert Wall with the Wall Street Journal. Um, there was some talk out of the Pentagon, obviously, that uh, with other activities in CENTCOM winding down in Syria and Iraq or slowing somewhat, that you will benefit from some of those assets being moved to, mm -hmm. to Afghanistan, ISR, and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering to what extent that is allowing you to perhaps do more than you were hoping in 2018. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that uh, is uh, indeed happening, and that's, that's been uh, discussed from the Pentagon. As uh, because of the success in the fight against ISIS in Syria and Iraq, has enabled uh, within the U.S. Central Command uh, rebalancing of assets to enable us to apply more pressure in Afghanistan. So that that indeed is happening, uh, and and that's very important to enable us to uh, again take the offensive and to enable the uh, Afghan operations in the way that'll make them most successful. Any other questions? Thank you very much indeed for a tour de force on Afghanistan. It's a campaign that, as you say, most of the folks in uniform have either been there or their armies have been there um, or armed forces have been there. We've learned so many lessons, uh, some of which we shouldn't have had to uh, relearn. 
uh, we learnt, um, as you mentioned, that this does, uh, this does not just fall to the military, that uh, the military strategy has to be interlinked with developmental, political, economic strategies to work. And I'm happy to say that uh, that has come together very well under the, under the uh, Afghan government and other pre under President Ghani's government. We also learned that mass is important in stabilization operations, that if you try and do it with too few people, things uh, go downhill and you can't sustain the secure environment in which political development can occur. And of course, the solution to that has been to generate uh, a huge um, Afghan security force and uh, rapidly to build the confidence. And as you say, they're now carrying the fight. Um, but uh, we've also learned one other lesson, which is uh, the need for staying power. Mm -hmm. And uh, not only in terms of our government's commitment to that country, uh, whether it be through military support or econ continued economic and political support, but also through the commitment of our people. And I can't think of anybody um, who's demonstrating that more than you, Mick. Um, having been there a couple of years, I think you've just had the announcement you're going to stay there for another year. I can tell you it went down hugely well from President Ghani and the Afghan side. It's a demonstration of real commitment from you and your nation. And uh, on behalf of all of our nations, we thank you for your service. Thanks. Thank you.